Jane Pritchard was a very bright student who had a love for growing plants and shrubs. She studied hard and made school one of her top priorities, and when she graduated Poolsville High School in 1976, she was her class's valedictorian. After high school, she would attend Western Maryland College, where she studied political science and biology, and in 1980 would graduate with honors. After college, she became a botanist, but still had her sights set high and wanted to pursue law school with a study in environmental law. With this in mind, in 1986, she would return to college to pursue a master's degree in botany. Jane lived about two hours away from Blackbird Forest State Park in Delaware and had studied the wild hog peanut the summer before for her master's degree. On September 20, 1986, she would leave her home in Clarksburg, Maryland and make the two-hour trip back to the park. She was driving her 1980 Chevy Blazer and arrived to the park before 8 a.m. and started working on her research. Visitors in the park would say that they saw her working off the side of a dirt road in the forest, surrounded by electronic equipment and engrossed in her research. Around 5.30 p.m. that day, two campers would find Jane's partially clothed body lying 20 feet from her equipment with a gunshot wound to her back. Investigators said that Jane had been doing a minute-by-minute recording of data when it ended abruptly before 10 a.m. Forest officials would say there was between 25 and 50 hunters in the 7,000-acre forest that day because it was the first weekend of Delaware's squirrel hunting season. While investigators refused to provide any details on the shooting, they were certain it was no accident. Two days after her death, a squirrel hunter would come forward and claim he saw Jane talking to another hunter around 10 a.m. that day. However, the more investigators questioned the hunter, the more they started becoming suspicious and would eventually accuse him of killing Jane due to all the inconsistencies in his story. He would be charged and a trial date was set. However, in August 1987, before he was set to go to trial, all charges were dropped. That's because a DNA test done on Hare found at the crime scene proved he was innocent. This made investigators realize they should take the hunter's claim more seriously and start looking for an unknown white male around 5'9 with a medium build seen wearing a brown jacket and blue jeans. Despite interviewing nearly 300 people, detectives were unable to arrest a suspect and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Dantel Johnson was born on September 8, 1994. She lived with her family in Newark, Delaware when she disappeared on February 3, 2010 at the age of 15. Her mother dropped her and her brother off at school that morning, but a few hours later, Jantel, who was five months pregnant, called her mother and stated that she didn't feel well and that she was going home early. She apparently arrived home at Autumn Park Apartments on Winter Haven Drive, but later when her brother came to pick her up for church, she was nowhere to be found. The door to the apartment was unlocked and there was no indication of forced entry or a struggle. Jantel's personal belongings, including her purse, eyeglasses, and winter clothes were left behind. At 10 p.m., when she was still not home and her family could not reach her by phone, her mother would report her missing. Her family believes she left the apartment voluntarily and didn't plan on being gone long, but something happened to her while she was out. Many people speculate that since the last call on her phone was made from her boyfriend, that he may have called her to come outside, and since it was cold, she got into his car to talk and then met with foul play. The alleged father of her unborn child was a 26-year-old man who has a history of domestic violence against another woman that he has a child with. He has been interviewed by police but was uncooperative. However, he has not yet been named as a suspect in her case. Records also do not indicate that his vehicle was ever searched. Her family stated they had accepted Gentile's pregnancy and were supportive of her decision to keep the baby and they do not believe she ran away from home. She had run away from home one time before but had returned home very quickly. Because of this one incident, police initially thought she was a missing runaway. This case has sadly received very little attention, with no news conferences or much publicity at all. 
Authorities do believe she may still be in the local area or that she may be in Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, or New York. They've also speculated that she may be in the company of the man she was allegedly pregnant by and he reportedly has ties to these other states. However, many people fear that her boyfriend caused her harm due to the risk of serving jail time because of the Delaware laws concerning statutory rape. Her hair was in braids when she disappeared and her ears are pierced. She needs glasses or contact lenses but wasn't wearing any at the time of her disappearance. She was last known to be wearing a black ski jacket with a fur-trimmed hood. Her family continues to search for answers in hopes for some kind of justice, but as of today, this case remains unsolved. Twenty-eight-year-old Mary Ann Knightley was last seen by her husband Roy on February 18, 1998. She was reportedly leaving that night because she just needed to get away, which is something her husband Roy claims she often did. It remains unclear if this was due to marital problems or just general stress in her life. Roy said on that night of the 18th, Mary Ann packed a bag and said she was going to visit her sister in Florida. While she was getting ready for her trip, Roy said he fell asleep around 11.30 p.m. and claimed when he woke up at 1 a.m. she was gone from their bare home at 1517 DuPont Highway. This is where the story gets a little confusing and some of Roy's accounts of the night don't seem to add up. Detective Walter Newton with the Delaware State Police said that at 11 p.m. the day she disappeared, she borrowed a van from her mother, saying she would return it the next day. Suspiciously, her husband Roy was the one who returned the van and said Mary Ann had asked him to. He could not say how Mary Ann planned to travel to Florida without having the van. He also noted that he wasn't sure how much money she had on her. So did she pick up the van at 11 p.m. and then ask him to return it before he fell asleep at 11.30 p.m.? Something doesn't add up and that seems like a very short period of time unless her mother lived very close by. What makes more sense is after picking up the van, did she go back to her house to get her things and Roy and her got into an argument and she never actually left? Maybe Roy possibly made up the story of him sleeping to cover up what actually happened that night. Again, this is all speculation and has never been proven. Marianne's cousin, Rosemary Williams, did confirm that she was known to leave her home for up to three days without any contact, but had never left for longer than that. While multiple sites claim her husband reported her missing, a newspaper clipping from the News Journal in Delaware says her mother was the one who reported her missing. This was on February 26, 1998, eight days after Roy claimed she left their home for Florida. To this day, Roy remains a person of interest and foul play is suspected in her disappearance. Sadly, she left behind four children and her family still seeks answers, but as of today, this case remains unsolved. Sean White was born on November 6, 2002. At four weeks old, Sean's father, Thurman White, picked him up at the infant's mother's home for an overnight stay on December 8, 2002 in Wilmington, Delaware. The next day, Thurman returned to the apartment of Sean's mother, Tanya Graham, around 8.30 p.m. However, he did not have Sean with him and told Tanya that a woman would come by later and bring him. After two hours, when no one had appeared, Thurman and Tanya began to argue about it and he stabbed her three times in the neck and then fled the apartment. Her five other children were also in the home at the time of the attack. She was rushed to the hospital in serious condition and luckily survived and was released from the hospital two days later. Thurman turned himself in to the Wilmington police the day after the attack just before midnight. He still did not have Sean and refused to say where he was. Thurman has at least two other children, one who lived with Tanya and one who lived with him at his home in the 200 block of 29th Street. Police originally charged Thurman with second degree assault for his attack on Tanya, but later upgraded the charges to first degree attempted murder. According to court records, he was convicted in June 1993 of second-degree assault, third-degree assault, and first-degree criminal trespass. 
He was also convicted of terroristic threatening in September 1998 in another case. Thurman pleaded guilty to assault, possession of a deadly weapon during a felony, and endangering the welfare of a child. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison and seven years of probation after his release. Police have searched Thurman's home and seized his boat. Three dozen police officers and recruits searched the Cherry Island landfill for evidence, but nothing was found. Thurman continues to refuse to cooperate and tell what happened to Sean and claims that Tanya knows where the infant is. His family still seeks answers and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Fifty-year-old Susan Ledyard was a language arts teacher at Academy Park High School. She was married to Benjamin Ledyard and they lived in Wilmington, Delaware. Susan was described as a night owl and it would not be out of the ordinary for her to be on the phone late at night or go for a walk with her dog when school was out for the summer. On the night of July 22, 2019, Susan was on summer break and her husband had gone to a movie that evening with a friend. When he returned home, he saw Susan around 11 p.m. on the back porch drinking wine and texting and says he then went to bed. Susan's older sister, Missy, says she texted with her sister that evening and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Her last text to her sister was at 12.29 a.m. Her phone records indicate that Susan continued to text and call friends until 2.47 a.m. the next morning. The next four hours remain a mystery. Delaware State Police said her car left her home at 3.02 a.m. and arrived about a mile away just two minutes later. The car was then parked at the Walker's Mill Road near the Rising Sun Road Bridge over the Brandywine River. Video footage shows that her headlights were then turned off. Police said because it was so dark out, they could not determine if anyone got into or out of her black 2016 Honda Civic. Around 7.30 that morning, the abandoned vehicle that was parked in an unusual position on Walker's Mill Road was reported to officials. Soon after, her body was found by a construction worker in the Brandywine River by Northeast Boulevard in Wilmington with visible injuries about three miles from where her car was parked. Her autopsy would show that she died from drowning and blunt force trauma and her death was ruled a homicide. Police and family members believe that Susan was alive between the hours of 3 and 7 a.m. because she was wearing a Fitbit, which revealed how many steps she took and that she had a pulse. The steps added up to less than a mile. Police state that they do not know where she entered the river, but they do not believe it was in the area where her car was parked. This is since the river had a lot of obstructions, such as dams, bridge piers, exposed rocks, and areas of shallow water. It is not believed that a body would have floated from where her car was parked to where her body was found, especially in the short period of time. Police also state that they do not believe that she committed suicide. Some people speculate that she may have mixed the sleeping pill Ambien with the wine that she was drinking. Ambien is a sedative hypnotic and especially when mixed with alcohol has caused many people to drive and do all sorts of things that they would never normally do and at times with no memory of it. However, I was unable to find results of a toxicology report or any reports of this being the case and it is still being investigated as a homicide. Her family continues to mourn her loss and as of today, this case remains unsolved. <laughs> 